Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the word Anna Anacephalus. Okay, Ron, that has to be the dumbest word you have ever had on the show. So true. Excuse me? Well, it's an adjective that means a partial or total absence of a brain. I see. but it's nothing to do with the election. Someone broke into my home tonight and stole some valuable evidence against Rocky Marino that I was going to turn over to you tomorrow. What sort of evidence? Enough of the kind to send Marino to the chair. Great Scott, Davis. If I could do that, I'd win the election hands down. Don't let my publisher know, or I'll be looking for a new typewriter. You better come over here right away. My secretary got a look at the man who broke open my safe. Right away, Davis. This is the break I've been looking for. This is Miss Mitchell, my secretary. Can you tell me exactly what happened here tonight, Miss Mitchell? I knew about the evidence Mr. Davis had against Marino, of course, and I came here tonight to retype the case summary that Mr. Davis had prepared. Yes, Croydon, I had been working on this expose for several months. Tonight it was to be finished. Tomorrow you would have been handed the election on a silver platter. We've got to recover those papers. I know what the thief looked like. Excellent. Now, please proceed. He was rather a tall man. He walked with a limp. The strange part of it is that he didn't wear a hat. Uh, What was the color of his hair? Uh, To tell the truth, I I didn't notice. There wasn't too much light in the room. Where were you when all this eyewitness stuff was going on, Miss Mitchell? Well, I had just opened the wall safe here when I heard muffled footsteps in the hall. I knew it couldn't be Mr. Davis, as he had just phoned me a minute or two before that. That's right, Gordon. I just had time to push the safe door shut and run behind the sofa there when he came in. Did he go directly to the safe? Yes, I didn't have time to shove the picture back over it. I was afraid to show my face too much, so I stayed hidden most of the time behind the couch. How long did you have to stay there? Oh, he worked on the safe about 20 minutes. Then he finally got it open, took out the papers, and ran out. I see. Tell me, Miss Mitchell, how long have you worked for Mr. Davis? Uh, About a year. Why? Because you're out of a job. Your story is nothing but a pack of lies. in Miss Mitchell's story calls the district attorney's suspicion. In a moment, we'll know, but first... The strange part is that he didn't wear a hat? Agreed. And that is not the only flaw in Miss Mitchell's dissertation. I know. The guy was tall, and yet somehow he didn't wear a hat. Wrong. The hat is not the thing. Oh. Okay, then, what? He ran out of the room. Okay, BG, I know that the hat is dumb, but running out of the room? Trust me. That's not gonna happen. Trusting you is like a car out of gas. Doesn't go anywhere. And you are an idiot. Oh, that's a good comeback. And now, back to our story. But I told you the truth, Mr. Croydon. Then how do you explain the inconsistencies in your story? First you told me the thief walked with a limp, and then you told me he ran from the room. But the big lie in your fairy tale, Miss Mitchell, came when you said you just had time to push the safe door shut and then hide behind the couch. 
If that was so, the thief never would have had to work 20 minutes to open the safe. It never could have been locked. No safe locks unless the combination is turned or a key is used. Come on, Davis. You've got a front-page story on my re-election as soon as Miss Mitchell returns the evidence. Well, BG, you were right again. Of course. If the man was tall and was not wearing a hat and also had a limp, it would be impossible to run out of the room. Well, also, he was pretty anencephalous. Oh, really? Well, why did the guy work on an open safe for 20 minutes? Ron, you are amazing. You know, I've heard that before. Is that you say? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. On the show today, we tell you how to build a robot. Ron, I think that is illegal. Robots are going to be the fall of man. Well, it's not illegal, but it is a good science fiction story. We also have three brand new tales from you guys that come from the UK, Canada, and the Philippines. That sounds good. They are. So let's get the proverbial ball rolling with a long way to an angry planet. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? The Long Way to a Small, Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. Now, I'm going to take a guess and say that you've probably never heard of this book, even though it's listed as one of the 50 best science fiction stories of all time. It is a trip into the distant future where mankind has moved out into the galaxy and made it his own. Winner of the Hugo Award for Best Series, the acclaimed modern science fiction masterpiece follows a motley crew on an exciting journey through space. It is a lighthearted story from a rising science fiction star. Here's a clip from pretty early in the book. Ashby's ship, the Wayfarer, was spacious enough, but tiny compared to the homesteader he'd grown up on. When he'd first purchased the Wayfarer and filled it with crew, even he'd had to get used to the close quarters they kept. But the constant sounds of people working and laughing and fighting all around him, had become a comfort. The open was an empty place to be, and there were moments when even the most seasoned spacer might look to the star-flecked void outside with humility and awe. Ashby welcomed the noise. It was reassuring to know that he was never alone out there, especially given his line of work. Building wormholes was not a glamorous profession. The interspatial passageways that ran throughout the galactic commons were so ordinary as to be taken for granted. Ashby doubted the average person gave tunneling much more thought than you might give a pair of trousers or a hot-cooked meal. But his job required him to think about tunnels and to think hard on them at that. If you sat and thought about them for too long, imagined your ship diving in and out of space like a needle-pulling thread, well, that was the sort of thing that made a person glad for some noisy company. Ashby was in his office, reading a news feed over a cup of mech, when one particular sound made him cringe. Footsteps. Corbin's footsteps. Corbin's angry footsteps, coming right toward his door. Ashby sighed, swallowed his irritation, and became the captain. He kept his face neutral, his ears open. 
Talking to Corbin always required a moment of preparation and a good deal of detachment. Artist Corbin was two things, a talented algiest and a complete The former trait was crucial on a long-haul ship like the Wayfarer. A batch of fuel going brown could be the difference between arriving at port and going adrift. Half of one of the Wayfarer's lower decks was filled with nothing but algae vats, all of which needed someone to obsessively adjust their nutrient content and salinity. This was one area in which Corbin's lack of social graces was actually a benefit. The man preferred to stay cooped up in the algae bay all day, muttering over readouts, working in pursuit of what he called optimal conditions. Conditions always seemed optimal enough to Ashby, but he wasn't going to get in Corbin's way where algae was concerned. Ashby's fuel costs had dropped by 10% since he'd brought Corbin aboard, and there were few algists who would accept a position on a tunneling ship in the first place. Algae could be touchy enough on a short trip, but keeping your batches healthy over a long haul required meticulousness, and stamina, too. Corbin hated people, but he loved his work, and he was damn good at it. In Ashby's book, that made him extremely valuable. An extremely valuable headache. The door spun open and Corbin stormed in. His brow was beaded with sweat, as usual, and the graying hair at his temples looked slick. The wayfarer had to be kept warm for their pilot's sake, but Corbin had voiced his dislike for the ship's standard temperature from day one. Even after years aboard the ship, his body had refused to acclimate, seemingly out of pure spite. Corbin's cheeks were red as well, though whether that was due to his mood or from coming up the stairs was anyone's guess. Ashby never got used to the sight of cheeks that red. The majority of living humans were descended from the Exodus fleet, which had sailed far beyond the reaches of their ancestral sun. Many, like Ashby, had been born within the very same homesteaders that had belonged to the original earthen refugees. His tight black curls and amber skin were the result of generations of mingling and mixing aboard the giant ships. Most humans, whether space-born or colony kids, shared that nationless Exodan blend. Okay, but what is this one about, really? Rosemary Harper doesn't expect much when she joins the crew of the aging Wayfarer. While the patched-up ship has seen better days, it offers her a bed, a chance to explore the far-off corners of the galaxy, and most importantly, some distance from her past. She learns early on to keep to herself, She's never met anyone remotely like the ship's diverse crew, including Sissix, an exotic reptilian pilot, chatty engineers Kissy and Jenks, who keep the ship running, and Ashby, their noble captain. Life aboard the Wayfarer is chaotic and crazy, exactly what Rosemary wants. It's also about to get extremely dangerous when the crew is offered the job of a lifetime. Tunneling wormholes through space to a distant planet is definitely lucrative and will keep them comfortable for years. But risking her life? Well, that wasn't part of the plan. The first volume in Chambers' Wayfarer series is a pure, rip-roaring fun space opera with a big gooey heart. Chamber proves that spacefaring needn't be about the destination. Sometimes, it's all about the journey. Now, if that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can have The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet for free. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also grants you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for more of your stories. 
These are your stories, sent by you, for you. story comes from the UK. Southampton is a port city in the ceremonial county of Hampshire in southern England. It was sent in by Margaret Smith, who is an avid ghost hunter and spiritualist. She has titled her story, The Nightclub Poltergeist. During the school summer holidays, my twin and I would be taken to my mom's work. At the time, she was a secretary for a nightclub which operated in the old Regency Pier building in Southampton. We used to run around that old building. As kids, my brother and I were obsessed with ghosts. We still are today. What we experienced one day would cement this interest. Here is our story. One day, one of the members of the staff told us that the cleaning crew refused to come in when it was dark. They claimed that they saw a misty figure and a feeling of being intensely watched. The chef told us that he sometimes came in early to start food prep and would find all of the cupboards open. Also, the pots and pans would be laid out in lines on the floor. The alarms were never tripped. And the cameras? Well, they saw nothing. This was music to our ears, and so the first thing we did was visit the kitchen. My brave brother stepped in and asked, If anyone's in here, show yourself. With that, some eggs on the counter flew across the room and smashed. We barreled it out of there, and when I mean run, we were absolutely out of there in a flash. We ran to our mum, white as sheets, and explained what happened. She said that maybe a lorry went by and the vibrations knocked them off. Absolutely not. The place was closed for ages. It reopened as a Thai restaurant, and I got to go to opening night through some weird coincidences. As soon as I passed that kitchen again for the first time in 15 years, I felt a cold finger down my back and the feeling of being watched. I had to wonder if it is still up to its old tricks for the new owners. Margaret Smith, Southampton. Well, Margaret, that is a great one. And thank you for listening to the show and telling us your story. It's been a while since we've had one from the UK. That does sound like a poltergeist to me and had to do a bit of research. I think I found your restaurant. The Royal Thai Pier Restaurant has some really great reviews for their food. But alas, they didn't talk about any ghost activity. And that's probably a good idea. This next story comes from Alex Winters from Alberta, Canada. Alex didn't title his story, so I have given it this name, The Barefoot Ghost. Hello, my name is Alex and I'm 35 years old. I've been sensitive to the paranormal and I've attracted both things human and non-human as long as I can remember. I have many stories and this was not my first experience but it stands out to me because of how I felt. When I was a kid, about 11 or 12, I used to walk to and from school and would always take a shortcut through the local cemetery. One day after school, I was walking through the cemetery as usual, and I tripped and fell. As I went to get up, I saw bare feet in front of me, and I immediately felt uneasy. I stood up, and what I did... I saw what looked like a woman standing right in front of me wearing a white nightgown that went down to her knees. She was barefoot and had long black hair. Oddly, she was looking down at her feet. I felt very unsettled by her, like I could be in danger. I don't know if that's the best way to describe the feeling I got. It wasn't a feeling of immediate danger, 
more of a be very careful sort of feeling, if that makes any sense. I said hello and she looked up at me. That is when I noticed her eyes were blood red and looked very reptilian with vertical pupils. Then she looked, or rather it felt like she looked through me, and spoke. You need to be more careful and get home right now. Then she disappeared. I never saw her again, and I have no idea what she was, but it somehow inherently I knew that she could have easily hurt me if she wanted to. Ron, have you ever heard of anything like this? Also, if any of your listeners have any idea of what she could have been, please let me know. Alex Winters, Alberta, Canada. Well, Alex, there is a lot of lore on this, and I hate to say it, but the one that fits the best is the Banshee. Minus the scream, of course. I won't say that that is what you saw, but it does fit the bill. Next time I speak to Sylvia, I will ask her about it. If any of you want to comment on Alex's story, send me a note and I will post a follow-up on this one. Alex, thank you for sharing your story. Our last story comes from Penny Whitman, who sent this in via the story submission banner on the main website. Penny is from Buscan Village in the Philippines and has titled her story, The Handprints. This is one of my many experiences with the paranormal. It happened while my friends and I were hanging out. It was myself, Dustin, and two of our other friends, Brandon and Drew. We are all military brats and have lived here for the past six months. The four of us were gathered in Dustin's garage, simply hanging out and talking about all manners of school problems. During the talk, Dustin had made his way to the opposite side of the garage next to the garage door. The three of us hadn't noticed that this was strategic on Dustin's part. See, there was a light switch there. Dustin had hatched a scheme to try to scare us by suddenly turning the lights off in the middle of our conversation. It was near midnight and we were already pretty wound up. It was guaranteed to leave us in complete darkness, so Dustin turned out the lights. It startled us at first, but we quickly realized that he was trying to scare us. We asked him multiple times for him to turn the lights back on, to which he responded with poorly acted confusion. He eventually turned them back on for us. They were very bright. We were blinded for a second and had to let our eyes adjust to the light. That's when we saw it. For some strange reason, when the lights came back on, the three of us were on the opposite side from Dustin, facing the wall opposite the garage door. It was painted white, so it made this very noticeable to us. What we saw was a black handprint that was slightly faded. Just this lone handprint. Now, that may seem like it's easily explainable, which it definitely could be. However, what happened next can't be. The three of us mumbled at each other for a second, all asking if we remembered seeing that handprint before the lights went out. We all agreed that we had not. Justin asked what was going on, and we told him that we saw a black handprint. He must have thought we were joking because he didn't take us seriously at all and turned the lights out on us again. This time we reacted with a little more anger, telling him to turn the lights back on. He tried to joke with us for a bit, but we weren't in the mood. He caught the hint and turned the lights back on. When our eyes adjusted again, we saw them. Multiple black handprints all overlapping each other in a horizontal, straight line, leading from one wall to the next. Every wall in the garage now had a line of overlapped black handprints. They 
were surrounding us. It looked as if though something or someone had been running on all fours horizontally around us, circling us. Dustin saw them as well. A feeling of terror and panic set in all of us. We trampled over each other, trying to get out of the garage. Drew pushed his hands on my back, ramming me through the door into the house. The three of us spilled into Dustin's living room floor. We couldn't catch our breath and kept shouting nonsense to each other, trying to make sense of what just happened. We had a hard time calming down. We tried to convince ourselves that it didn't even happen, that we only thought we had seen the handprints. However, when we mustered up enough courage to check, we were greeted with the handprints still being there. The garage became a restricted area for us when we all hung out. The only time we would go back in was when we tried to do our own investigating. We never cleaned the handprints off. I'm not sure if it was out of fear of angering whatever had left them, or it was a reminder that it did happen. Either way, it is still one of the craziest experiences I've ever had, and it will always stick with me. Penny Whitman, Baskin Village, the Philippines. I can honestly say I've never heard anything like that before. That is one creepy event and it defies any and all logic. I tried to do some Google research on what it could mean and for one of the first times ever, I got the message, it looks like there aren't many great matches for your search. I have no idea what you experienced, but I do thank you for your story. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, like Penny did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story is a robot tale with a twist. What if robots were not only sentient, but could also reproduce at will? Would the world have to look at them differently? The idea for this came to the mind of author Clifford D. Simak long before our AI robot questions of today. The story is titled, How To, and first appeared in the pages of Galaxy Magazine in November of 1954, and then again on X-1 when they adapted Clifford's story to radio. A man orders a robotic dog kit in the mail, and instead receives an android, one ready to serve in every capacity and equally ready to reproduce himself a thousandfold. All of his problems vanish. That is, until the government sticks their bean-counting nose into it. It is titled, How To, and it first aired on March 3rd, 1956. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one.
Tonight, Clifford D. Simak's story of the 21st century, How To. Build your own three-dimensional color TV set. Complete kit, screwdriver assembly in three hours. Now, nah, I've done that. Well, let's see. A dog is man's best friend. Build your own dog. Complete kit, spaniel model, only $250. Yeah, hey, that's it. My next project. <laughs> Gordon, is that you? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Where, where are you? Out on the terrace. I'm just uh, finishing a landscape. Oh, hi, yeah. Grace, look, did, did, did it come? No, don't kiss me. You'll uh, get all full of paint. I wasn't going to. Where is the package? Well, they set it against the side of the house. Over there, see? Oh, it did, it, it, it came, huh? <laughs> I want to look at it. I would have put it down in the basement, but I couldn't lift it. Hey, this, this is pretty heavy for a spaniel. I, I can't lift this myself. Well, I'll start dinner as soon as I finish this part of the picture. I want to get the grass while the light's right. Yes, yeah, all right. So no hurry. I want to examine the kit anyhow. <laughs> of course, if you didn't waste our money on things like dog kits, maybe we could afford a robot and I wouldn't have to cook. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right. There. That should be enough for now. The light's beginning to get tricky. Good night. You're not going to open that thing here on the terrace. Now, you'll no, make no, a mess. No, no, I, I just want to see the parts. Look, you know, this thing's too big and heavy to be a dog kit. Maybe it's a Great Dane. No, 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 it can't be. Look, here, here, here's the shipping tag. From How To Kits, Inc. to Gordon Knight. One dog kit, spaniel model, $250, paid in full. The Great Dane cost $350. Well, all I can say is that must be the world's biggest spaniel. Hey, you know, that's, that's darn funny. I told you, I don't want you fooling around with it up here. Now, take it down in Grace, the basement. Grace, this, this can't be a dog kit. You know what I think? It's a robot. A robot? But you didn't order a robot. Or did you? No, no, certainly not. They made a shipping error. That's about the size of it. Ah, oh, doggone it. I'll have to put this crate back together again and call the express company. Are you going to return it? Well, certainly I'm going to return it. You don't think we can keep it, do you? Well, why not? The tag says paid in full, so they can't say we owe them anything. But it's a robot. They're expensive. Well, I don't see how the company will ever know. When inventory time comes around, they'll be short one robot and long one dog. Hmm. <laughs> Because I've always wanted to put together a real robot. Lord knows when I'd get another chance. <laughs> then it's settled. No, 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 it is not settled either. I tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll put it together just to see what it's like. But, uh, but I won't activate it. See, I mean, I'll, you know, disassemble it right away and ship it back to the company. <laughs> Well, there, there we are. Hello, Grace, look, look at it. Isn't that a beauty, though? You finished? <laughs> well, all but the activating. Oh. Grace. What? You know, uh, I was just thinking, um, how do I know I've got all the parts adjusted properly? I haven't the remotest idea. No, well, you know, I mean, the only sure way would be to test it. You mean activate? Well, only for a minute or two, you understand. I mean, just to be sure. Then what? Well, then I'll <laughs> disassemble it, naturally. Well, all right. As long as you don't take too long. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll have it in a jiffy. Now, here, look. Oh, see, all I have to do is just put on the activating plate. And turn this lock nut in like so. Now, wait a minute. Just adjust the automatic current control. Huh? <laughs> yeah, there. Now, that, that should do it. Now, now stand back. Stand back. And I'll, I'll turn it on. Well, I hope it works. Oh, it'll, it'll work. It'll work. I followed the directions... To the letter. You ready? Now. It works! Yeah, I'll have to oil that joint. Wait. Grace, it's moving its head. My name is Albert. I am a robot. What is there to do? Well, it certainly has a nice voice. Now, 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 take it easy, Albert. Just sit down and rest and we'll have a little talk. There's no need to rest. I was made to work. Well, as long as he, uh, it, doesn't need to rest, I can think of a hundred things for it to do. Now, there's the house and the garden and the lawn. No, 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 look, Grace, I... I wonder if he could learn to cook. A robot can be taught to do anything a person can do. Oh. No, no, hold on a minute, uh, Albert, please, and listen to me. We, we, we can't keep you, you understand. I mean, you, you were sent here by mistake. 
But, I mean, as long as you're activated, there wouldn't be any harm in letting you do a few things. I can do anything. Good. The whole house needs a thorough cleaning. Grace. Then, of course, I'd, I'd like some new drapes for the study. No, no. And the kitchen hasn't been painted for four years. Then there's that leaky faucet. Oh, Lord. Well, what's the matter? Attachments. There aren't any. Look, oh. he can't do all that stuff without attachments. And they cost almost as much as the robot itself. Uh, don't worry about attachments. Just tell me what's to be done. Well, <laughs> you heard my wife. <laughs> oh, what about your grounds? Oh, I got a hundred beat-up acres that need attention, but... Of course, I realize that that's too much work, huh? Don't worry about a thing. I can fix it for you. You'd... I will make the necessary equipment. <laughs> Make your own attachment? Don't worry about a thing. Yeah, but how? Oh, for heaven's sake, stop arguing with him and let him get to work. I'm not arguing. Morning, Gordon. Your coffee's ready. Yeah. How'd you sleep, dear? Oh, not so good. Kept hearing noises all night. Oh, that was Albert working in the basement. Yeah. Albert? Hey, gosh, that's right. I forgot robots don't sleep. Well, he was working all night. When I came into the kitchen just now, I found the breakfast all prepared. He can cook. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. What's he doing now? Oh, I don't know. Making something, I think. Oh, Gordon, he's going to be such a tremendous help to me. I'll be able to spend more time than ever with my yeah, painting. Wait, now, wait a minute. What makes you think we can keep him? I mean, no, no, Grace. I mean, we could get into trouble. Well, I don't see how. I'll tell you what. Why don't you walk over and call on Anson Lee? He could advise you. What does he know about it? He's a lawyer. Well, technically, he's a lawyer. I mean, he never seems to work at it anymore. Well, you have to understand, Anson, that's all. Look, I understand him all right. He's a reactionary, a throwback to the 20th century. Spends all his time lying in a hammock, drinking and reading Proust. Well, it's what he enjoys doing. I'll bet that guy never assembled a kit in his life. Can you imagine that? Well, we all have our peculiarities. Just the same, he could give you legal advice. Mm, well, all right, all right. I'll go over after breakfast. If it'll make you feel any happier, pass the cream. I'll have a drink, Knight. Hard cider. Made it myself. Thought you didn't go in for home projects, Lee. Oh, I don't. Making this cider was the first honest work I've done in years. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Every time I get a end to work, I look across at your place and I decide against it. How many rooms have you added to that house since you got it built? Eight. Good Lord, think of that. Eight rooms. No, 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 it's not hard once you get the next. It's kind of fun. Yeah. You just buy a how-to kit. Yeah, sure, I mm -hmm. know. Just follow directions. That's right. Anybody can build a robot on a kitchen table. Well, no thanks. Well, why do you say that? What? I mean about building a robot. Oh, I don't know. I suppose I expect you to start building one any time now. You've done everything else. <laughs> uh, what's got into people these days, Knights? They just aren't equipped to enjoy their leisure. That is, most of them aren't. Me? <laughs> I am. I read, and I lie in a hammock, and now and again I even think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I guess that makes me an eccentric. Here, have another drink. Oh, no, 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 thanks. I'll have to get back to my place. Albert, Albert! You call me, sir? Yes, yeah, Albert, listen to me. I, uh... Albert, I have reached a decision about you. But I'm not Albert, sir. I... Huh? You would hardly expect Albert to be clipping hedges. Well, if, if you're, you're not Albert, who are you? Abe. Albert is down in the basement. Well, what are you doing here? Where did you come from? If you wish to talk to me, you will have to move along the hedge with me. Oh. I cannot yeah. stop working. Oh, okay, okay, move along. But where, 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 where did you come from? Albert made me. Albert made you? And, I, and now he's down in the basement working on Alfred. Alfred? Another robot? Certainly. That is what Albert is for. He makes robots. Oh, no. Oh, uh, Albert! Oh, there you are. Albert, what's going on here? I'm reproducing. What? I have a built-in mother. I don't know why they named me Albert. I should have had a female name. Oh, but you shouldn't be able to make robots. Look, boss, you worry a lot. You want robots, don't you? Well, yeah, I guess everybody could use a robot. <laughs> I make robots. I'm, I'm making all you need. Albert. 
Albert, put down that head and listen to me. I want to have a serious talk. Sure, boss. What's on your mind? Now, Albert, I... I just looked through your packing case and I found this tag. Look, it says X, 190. X, Albert. Don't you understand? That means you're an experimental model. That's correct. You were never meant to be sold. That is also correct. I know. Don't you see? That means trouble. I, I can't keep you. I've already taken care of that. How do you mean? I filed off my serial number and replated the surface. Well, 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 why did you do that? So that they can't come around and take me back. They made me, and then they got scared and shut me off. But you're not afraid of me. I'm not. You assembled me and let me go to work. Yep. I'm sticking with you, boss. Wait, wait a minute. This could mean a lot of trouble for me, Albert. No trouble. They can't prove a thing. I'll swear that you made me. I'll not let them take me back. They will take no chances next time. They'll break me up for scrap. Oh, but, but look, if you make too many robots... Robots are useful. You need a lot of them in this place. Now, don't worry, boss. Everything will work out. Well... I'll take good care of you. Yeah. Now, I must go back to work. Adelbert is nearly finished. Mr. Knight, I'm from the county tax office. Tax assessor. Oh, I didn't know you fellas came around more than once a year. Ordinarily, we don't. This is a special case. Oh? Made a lot of improvements in the place the past few days. Oh. Landscaping, painting, yeah. building. Well... And... Afraid I'll have to boost your assessment some. I see. Heard about those robots of yours, too. Uh, robots? Personal property, you know. Have to pay a tax on them. Just, uh, how many have you got? Oh, one or two. I've been counting. They move around so fast I can't be sure, but I estimate the number at 38. Is that right? If you say so. 38 it is, then. They cost 10000 apiece. I'll assess them at five. That's, let's see, that's $190,000. Oh, no, hey, that, that, that's pretty steep. But I'm going easy on you. By rights, I should only allow you a third for depreciation. Well, that's it, Mr. Knight. $190,000. Wait. We'll send you the bill with your quarterly statement. But... Good day. Good day. <laughs> Albert, look, I, I, I've been holding off until we got the new landscaping job under control, but I can't hold off any longer, any longer. I mean, we've we, we got to start selling some of the robots. Selling? Yeah, 20 of them. That should do for a start. The tax assessor was here. I need the cash. You can't sell the robots, boss. Why can't I? Because they're my family, my boys. Named after me, all of them. Albert, I'm sorry, but that, that, that's ridiculous. They're all I've got, boss. You wouldn't sell your own children, would you? Well... All their names start with A, just like mine. Abe, Adelbert, Alfred, Adam, Aaron, Anton, Axel. All right, all right, all right. Don't, don't go through the whole roll call. I mean, the point is I need the money. Don't you worry, boss. I'll fix everything. You have nothing to worry about. The point is, Mr. Knight, the Internal Revenue Department is always interested when a citizen shows a substantial capital gain during the year. Capital gain? I haven't made any capital gain. Oh, come, come, sir. I'm talking about the matter of some 52 robots. Well, as I understand it, their retail value is $10,000 each. So they say. 52 times 10,000 is $520,000. On capital gains, you pay 50% or $260,000. 200, oh. A tax, roughly, of $130,000. Well, 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 when, well, what do I do? By the 15th of next month, you must file a declaration of estimated income. You pay half of the due tax at that time and the balance in monthly installments. Monthly installments. And there's one other matter. One other matter? We investigated. We found you make $10,000 a year. Huh? Would you tell me, out of uh, personal curiosity, you understand? I understand. Just how a man of your particular means could show a capital gain of a half a million dollars in so short a time? I, I'm beginning to wonder myself. Well, our only concern is you pay your tax. Yeah. However, uh, some other branch of the federal government might very well want to ask some questions sometime. Oh? If I were you, Mr. Knight, I would be ready with some answers. Yeah. Good day. Good day.
Albert, now look, I tell you, this is, this is a crisis. Do you understand it? Like it or not, I have got to sell some of your boys, a whole bunch of them. Boss, I told you not to worry. Not to worry. Listen, I just came from the income tax people. I owe the government a cool 130 grand, and those boys don't fool around. I, I'm, I'm desperate. Money is no trouble, boss. Come here. Come where? Over here. Look at this. What's this? What, those, those, those bales? What have they got? Don't tell me. Full of money, boss. Help yourself. You mean that the actual real money in those bales? Not stage money now. Real money, boss. No ones, of course, but lots of tens and twenties. Yeah. Uh, that bale over there is full of fifties. Full of fifties. No, we didn't fool around with the ones. Albert, look me in the eye. Did you, did you make that money? You said you needed it. We took some bills and analyzed the ink. I found out how to weave the paper and made plates. I hate to sound immodest, boss, but uh, they're beautiful. Oh, my gosh. I'm a counterfeiter, too. We just ran off as much as we thought you'd need. Yeah. If it's not enough, we'll make some more. It's enough. Not, not another dollar. Well, you're the boss. Albert, listen to me. There, there, there are laws in this country. I mean, you just can't go out and print money. That's a crime, don't you understand? Now, look, you take it all outside and burn it right up. You understand? And don't print any more. That is an order. Gordon, are you down here? I'm busy. I hate to disturb you, dear, but I thought you ought to know about the sheriff. I don't want to know... The sheriff? He was here with a subpoena, or whatever you call them. That's what you call them. Seems the how-to company's going to sue us. Oh, no. Oh, no, all right, that does it, that Gordon, does it. where are you going? To see my lawyer. Uh, offhand, old man, I'd say you were in quite a jam. I didn't have to walk all the way over here to find that out. The point is, Lee, what in the name of heaven can I do? Well, first, you'll have to file a declaration of estimated income. Even if I can't pay? Well, especially if you can't pay. Oh. Technically, then, you haven't violated the law, and all they can do is to try to collect what you owe. Yeah. They'll probably uh, slap an attachment on your bank account. What bank account? I'm broke. Oh. Well, then, I'd say your major worry is the how-to company suit. Yeah. Now, if I were you, I'd settle it out of court. Out of court? Mm-hmm. They might uh, call off the action if you returned all the robots. Albert says he'll testify that I made him. Well, Albert can't testify. As a robot, he has no standing in court. Mm -hmm. No, you better give them back and uh, get what terms you can. No, 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 no. I, I, I won't do it. What? Huh? I won't. Don't you see? They don't want Albert back because they can use him. They want to break him up to maintain their robot prices. Don't you see? It might be a thousand years before his principle is rediscovered, if it ever is. Mm -hmm. Would that be bad? I don't know. Only time will tell that, but... I mean, you could say the same thing about any great invention. Look, no, I, I will not let them destroy Albert. Yes, I see your point, Knight. And I like it. You like it? Uh-huh. I'll take the case. Now, of course, I ought to warn you, I'm not a very good lawyer. I know. I don't work hard enough at it. But I, I, I do have a chance, huh? In all my practice at law, Knight, I never saw a man who'd gotten himself as fouled up as this. No. I'd say your chances are nil. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's Albert. Boss, I heard about the suit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all right, Albert. Mr. Lee here is going to handle our case. We robots want to help. Uh, I'm afraid there's not much you can do. Oh, yes, there is. I'm building a lawyer robot. He's building a lawyer robot? With far greater memory capacity than any human. And with brain computers that operate on logic. Now, that's what law is based on, isn't it? Logic. Well, so I've heard. But it won't work, Albert. To practice law, you must be admitted to the bar. To be admitted to the bar, you must have a degree in law and pass an examination. And although there's never been an occasion to establish a precedent, I suspect the applicant must be human. Lee, Lee, wait a minute. What about law clerks? I mean, they don't have to be human. Well, I'd say that was completely true. Yeah, then Albert's robots can be clerks. Mm -hmm. Well, could be. See what I mean? Yes. yes. It's never been done, but uh, there's nothing in the law that says it can't be done. Then it's settled. I'll make a dozen to start. Each one will be an expert in one phase of the law. Boss, you're going to have the most powerful battery of legal talent ever assembled under one roof. Quiet in the court. Mr. Lee, what is the meaning of this outrage? What outrage, Your Honor? Those, those robots sitting at the defense table. Oh, these, Your Honor, are my valued assistants. Robots? Yes, Your Honor. Take them away. 
They have no standing in this court. If Your Honor will excuse me, they need no standing. I am the sole representative of the defendant. My client is a poor man, and he is opposed by the most formidable array of legal talent money can buy. Now, surely the court will not deny him whatever assistance he's been able to muster. This, sir, is highly irregular. If it please, Your Honor, I should like to point out that we live in a mechanized age. The court clerk uses a machine to take down the transcript of these very proceedings. To my certain knowledge, no court has ever challenged the presence of such a device as an aid to the furtherance of justice. Now, if Your Honor can point out anything in the law, specifically barring these robots from the court... That's ridiculous, sir. Of course there is no such provision. At no time anywhere did anyone dream such a contingency would arise. In that case, sir, I ask the court for a favorable ruling. Mr. Lee, as you point out, there is no precedent for my ruling in any way but in your favor. Therefore, sir, with reluctance, I do so at this time. And what kind of a day has it been? It's a day in which a new kind of trial has suddenly captured the imagination of the public. A trial in which a man accused of misappropriating a robot has brought into court a whole battery of robots to aid in his defense. To give validity to their argument, Your Honor, it must first be proved that these robots are, in fact, the property of the plaintiff. That is the issue at trial in this case. So, in the now famous robot case, the issue has come down to this. Was the robot stolen or was he liberated? It is a far-reaching question indeed. Your Honor, I have already established that robots are possessed of free will, that they have the power of reasoning, and that they can most certainly reproduce. As to my worthy opponent's fourth contention, that they have no spiritual sense... I contend that this is irrelevant. There are agnostics and atheists in the human race, and in general, no one has denied them their full rights on this count. And so the trial has at last come to its end. The whole nation, indeed the whole world, awaits the momentous decision which must be handed down. In Washington, D.C., Treasury officials have been meeting steadily for a week to find some way to avoid the loss of the enormous taxes on robots in the event the decision rendered is in favor of the defense. One high government official has said that if robots are declared free and equal, it means they must be given full citizen rights under the Constitution. Already, the chairman of both major political parties are mapping campaigns to corner the robot vote. Welcome home, darling. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But what, what's going on here, Grace? I have more trouble getting into my own home than into the Pentagon. Oh, you mean the robots? They've set up a defense perimeter. I, a defense per- Uh-huh. Albert. Hello, boss. Welcome home. Albert, what is the meaning of all the barbed wire and the rocket launchers? Just precautions, boss. We're ready for any situation. Such as? Oh, like a mob deciding to take justice into its own hands, for instance. Or if the decision goes against us? That too, boss. You dear, you two go on and talk. I've really got to get back to my painting. I have a beautiful still life that I've simply got to finish. Yeah, yeah, I finish. Albert, listen. You can't fight the whole world. We won't go back. How two kits incorporated will never lay a hand on me or any of my children. Albert, th- th- this is madness, don't you understand? They'd get you with one bomb. And me too. Better to die fighting, boss, well, than to live in chains. I don't know. That's our motto. No matter what happens, we are ready for the decision. The court is ready to render its decision. It is the most difficult decision I have ever made. For in following the letter of the law, I fear I may be subverting its spirit. After long days of earnest consideration of both the law and the evidence, as presented in this court... I find for the defendant, Gordon Knight. I cannot rule otherwise. May I add that this ruling, in spite of the fact that I myself made it, outrages my social conscience. You did it, boss. You did it. We're free. Yes, Albert. 
we sure did it. Where's my wife? In the studio, painting. Not another landscape. Her fifth this week. She's doing very well. Yes, isn't she? And I am working on a new robot for her. A painter. Soon she won't have to bother doing it herself. That's nice. And you won't have to do anything anymore either, boss. Oh? Not a thing. Oh? We're going to take care of you from here on out. Thanks. Did I tell you about my new children yet? No, I don't think so. Alice, Angeline, Agnes, Agatha, Alberta, and Abigail. Daughters? Six of them, boss. And all with a built-in reproducing instinct just like mine. Oh, no. They're down in the basement now, turning out robots. Great. We've got everything worked out for you, boss. You won't have to worry about a thing for the rest of your life. No, Albert. Not a thing. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Name Your Symptom by Jim Harmon, a story of a future in which anyone who shunned a cure needed to have his head examined, assuming he still had one left. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you How To, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Clifford D. Simak and adapted for radio by William Welch. Featured in the cast were Alan Bunce, Anne Seymour, Les Damon, Joseph Bell, James Monks, William Key, Lawson Zerby, Santos Ortega, and Ben Grower. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Okay, I got to tell you, I loved this story, and I've never heard it before this week. I thought that I'd heard every X-1 episode, but I was surprised to find this one hanging out on the web. Actually, quite a nice surprise. This story was written by Clifford D. Simak, who was actually a newspaper reporter by trade. He was born in 1904 and worked full-time for the Minneapolis Star from 1939 until his retirement. Then he became a full-time writer of science fiction. He was considered as one of the grandmasters of the genre, and he was honored several times with awards for his contribution to science fiction literature. He never really cared how his technical devices worked. For him, they were just instruments for the purpose of telling good stories. My kind of author. That was episode number 581, and who sent in our stories? Margaret Smith, Alex Winters, and Penny Whitman all gave us some good stuff today. My thanks to you all. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.